Hi there, my name is Renee Hodge, and uh, welcome to uh, Tools for Children and Youth. There's a lot of background no noise now, so my wonderful students are hoping to mute your microphones for the moment. Um, we are, today's date is October 20th, and um, we have a bunch of topics to talk about, but uh, of course, um, one of the most exciting things that is happening is that um, you are um, probably deeply into thinking seriously about your multimedia review project, which is due on November 3rd. So before we go, before we go through the agenda and talk about what we're going to try to accomplish in the next hour or so, I thought it would be useful to provide a little bit of an open forum to review the upcoming deadlines for this class and to have kind of uh, you, uh, Chelsea and Christine and Michael and Tammy and Valerie and Billy, I would like you guys to sort of stand in for the other six students who aren't participating live and ask great questions. As I see it, the deadlines are as such. You have that multimedia review on November 3rd, your second reflective essay on November 17th, your Ignite video on December 1st, and your final project is due December 12th. Now's a place for open questions about any aspects of the workload for the course. What questions do you have? Okay. So Wait, no I have a question. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, okay, so it's um, the thing that's due on the third. You can. It's called like multimedia review, but if you you don't have to do a review if you're doing the story time, right? Very good. What a great question. Let's go to that page so we can understand it, because you're right, the title might be just a tad bit misleading, right? And that we don't want that, that title to get in the way. So right now I'm showing you the back end of what the WordPress site looks like, but let's go to the main page. Here we are at the main page, and up here under Work, Course Design, Readings, Videos, Assignments, it's called multimedia review, but you're right to notice that it can take endless number of forms. You are encouraged to think about producing option one, a promotional review, option two, a story time, option three, a critical review, and to develop your project, you're invited to go look at this website, which gives you some ideas about how to be how to use the digital tools and technologies. Um, so um, there you go. That's uh, the 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 flexibility that you have. Remember that it's due on November third, and you need to embed the product on your blog and tweet the link with the LSC 530 hashtag. Thanks for asking that good question. What other questions do you have? Uh, um, when it comes to doing a story time, does it have to be in front of a bunch of kids, or can it just be a video? <laughs> a very interesting question, right? Because one of the things that I will be looking for is that you are able to use the generic features of good story time, right? So that is a expectation. We uh, read about that in Virginia Walter. We've been sort of looking at different videos and uh, thinking more deeply about what are the characteristics of, of a story time. You know, having a real audience would certainly increase the authenticity of the performance. Because after all, story time is a performance, right? So real kids would be great, but you know, digital media. That um, sometimes an imaginary audience can kind of work for you, and I think there are creative possibilities there for you to consider and exploit. I have seen examples of children's media 
where there is no, where the audience is implied. And with the right creative strategies, I think uh, you might be able to pull that off. So I invite you to be creative in thinking about how to do a story time through digital media. I don't know if I answered your question or not. Uh, yes, for the most part. Um, I just wasn't sure if I would if I wasn't sure if I would if I wasn't able to get an audience if it was okay if I didn't have one. Right. Yeah, my sense of it is that if you don't have an audience, you'll find a creative strategy uh, to think about your essentially your your digital viewers as your audience, right? The folks who are watching this multimedia performance become your audience. They are they're not a live audience, but they're they're present, right? So think a little bit about that and that'll probably help you figure out a creative solution there. Thanks for asking that great question. What other questions do you have? No, yes, that means a thumbs up on your feeling like, yeah, I'm making through this course, it's doing I'm doing fine, I'm all over it. Right? <laughs> Alright, thumbs like this, like, oh shit, I'm freaked out, but I'm dealing. And then like, oh no, I'm feeling nervous. Alright, let me take your temperature, because how can I know when I only see you once a week? What's your temperature? I see a kind of sideways thumb. So Chelsea's got a thigh sideways thumb. Christine, what's your temperature on the thumbs up, thumbs down, or thumbs in the middle? I feel pretty I feel good. pretty good. It's just it's, it's something just, I haven't before. Uh huh. Well, well, you know there could be, but I feel but I feel confident. confident. Okay, good. One thing I would invite you to do is not wait till the last minute because I'm, I'm a former journalist. I'm a really bad person when it comes to deadlines. I do not, I'm not very charitable about that. So, and this, you've had a long lead time. So don't wait till the last minute because if something's going to go wrong, you can't say my dog ate my homework. It's not going to work with me. Okay? So, uh, all right, let's take a look at what's on tap for tonight. And uh, I think we should have some fun. I hope we have some fun. Um, so, we're really digging a little bit more deeply into the future of libraries and we are kind of setting up uh, Virginia Walter and the YALSA report, <laughs> really, I guess, uh, if, uh, if we're going to think about it. One thing I have to do is I have to talk to you about what a fantastic job you did in your Flipgrid responses. And I want to, um, I want to go to those responses now to showcase some really excellent ones. Um, as you know, I'm really deeply interested in creating outward-facing librarians. That's a really big topic of great importance to me. And one of the things that I observed as I listened to you talk about how some ideas from the world of the children's museum world might be relevant to uh, school and public librarians, I was really, really impressed at the high levels of thoughtfulness and quality. Uniformly, every single one of you was super, super amazing. So I'm just going to showcase three that I thought were particularly amazing. Starting Hi with Billy. Hi everybody, it's Billy. Um, my favorite part of this video was that it all seemed like so much fun, uh, which isn't always what you expect when the outcome is supposed to be learning. Uh, Children's Museums serve the purpose of an educational playground more so than libraries do. Uh, but I think that they, what they have in common is that they take learning out of the context of books in the classroom and open it up to entertaining ways to explore your own interests. Um, I also like that they take this a step further by promoting the idea that even in-class learning can be fun. Uh, they have their museum in a box, their artist in residence programs, uh, teacher training. Uh, these are great ways to stay relevant to the kids and connect them to the wider community while also supporting the work that schools do. Uh, I think that these ideas are very relevant to children's librarians uh, who are always looking for new ways to engage kids. Uh, setting up programs in schools is a good way of keeping in touch with the community and reminding them that the library is there and that it's a welcoming place for you to explore your own interests and then learn in different ways. Um, it does bring up some questions. Atlanta's Children's Museum program seems to be very robust, which uh, makes me think about money and wonder what other cities and states can actually afford to have such a robust program. Uh, they also talk about assessing the value of play as learning, and I think this is very important because teachers and librarians need to know exactly what the value of this is 
to best take advantage of it, uh, but also to balance it with other aspects of learning that may achieve different outcomes. Uh, and this is important because we want well-rounded kids. Uh, so I think these are some important. Okay. So, Billy, what I uh, well, let me just see if I can go back to my. Uh, uh, there we go. So, Billy, what I really liked about this um, uh, comment was uh, you clearly were doing some summarizing of the key characteristics of the um, museum, but you were also doing some synthesizing and connecting uh, what we learned in that video to stuff we've been talking about in class. And I want to comment especially on your really cool good question about money. Several of you in your Flipgrid said as your question was like how do you get the money to do this and how does that happen? And I'm really really glad that you future librarians are asking that question because whether you like it or not you will be responsible for bringing in money and resources as you move through your career, right? Because we cannot e expect uh, state and federal funding to cover uh, the full cost of library library services, and and that's been true for a uh, we that's been true for a long, long time. So, how do programs like museums and libraries get the money to do innovative things? Well, first of all, they have librarians and museum directors who are super, super collaborative and who gather a group of people together around some shared vision or shared idea. And turns out that people are emotionally satisfied being, by being able to contribute to something that's bigger than the, just their own self-interest. That's a deep human need. And so great library directors, like great museum directors, use the power of gathering people together under a shared vision. And sometimes that's a vision for a new program, right? Like um, yes. you know, like the um, artist in residence program or the Imaginators program. So there's a, a lot of power in <laughs> gathering people together under an idea. And once people are gathered, then the question is, what do you have to share? Time, talent, or treasure? Now a lot of busy people don't have much time. And maybe they, because they don't have time, they can't contribute their talent, but they can give money. And so other people can't give money, but they can give time or talent. And so I think it's really important, and it, this is going to relate to our grant writing uh, topic, which, com which is coming up next, to think about how you can mobilize people to... Uh, create new ideas and then to gather them together to figure out how to get the money and resources to pay for them. So another um, another one of these that I thought was really exceptional, Chelsea, it was yours. Uh, let me just go back to the um, let me go back to the Flipgrid. Um, I I love how you answered this question, Chelsea, and I think it was a really it raises some really interesting implications for school and public librarians. So let's let's listen to your comment. Hi guys, it's Chelsea. So I watched this video twice, um, once right after class and then again to kind of chew on it and mull it over. I think the biggest thing that sticks out for me in this video are the um, like museums to go. They deliver to the classroom and give the kids things that are relevant to Common Core and also kind of show how relevant they are um, and what they have access to at this museum that maybe the classrooms can't afford or might not think uh, along the same lines that this museum does. Um, I think that live libraries can really draw off of that and I really like the idea of sending someone to the classroom once a month to kind of check in on kids. Um, that's a great way to kind of get um, data for the community. You can talk to the kids right there and make sure that your library is staying kind of on track as well as being kind of a face that people recognize and want to go and see. The kids will tell their parents so-and-so stopped by from the library today, I want to go to the library, I like this person, we should read this book. Um, so you can kind of get more, drum up more support from the community that way by going right to the source. Um, the things that I would want to know more about would probably be, uh, I'd like to see how something like this had affected children's like test-taking scores, or I, I want kind of like more direct data from that, um, supporting why there's, you know, 
what comes after they've done all of this work and what's the next step. Okay, so one of the things I like about that response, Chelsea, is that uh, you have like two or three really interesting themes. Um, you, it kind of relates to the time, talent, or treasure. It turns out that 90% of life is simply showing up, right? And so what happens if once a month a, a librarian walks into a classroom, right, and does a, a little something, right? That's an example of like talent as a means to cultivate relationships. And the win-win that you describe is just formidable. And I'm really glad that you made that connection because I think librarians uh, do that. When, when librarians do that, they really serve their patrons well. And then I was also really intrigued about your, um, your questions about impact. Um, and obviously in other courses you're learning a little bit more about how, that issue of how to measure impact. Um, and it turns out that in the library world it's pretty sticky and complicated. Um, last year I had the great good fortune to be invited to a summit that was hosted by the AASL uh, about issues of assessment in school librarianship. I was one of 40 uh, scholars from library schools from across the country and we sat around for two days with a, a lot of very serious social science, uh, science uh, researchers to talk a little bit about how do we measure the impact of school libraries programs and services. Two days, 40 smart people, and you know, you guys already know I'm kind of an insider-outsider, right? You know, I'm not the choir. Right, because I am an outsider uh, by training to this community. And here's what I observed. When the social scientists uh, said to us, look, 30 years ago, nurses had no pay, no status, and nobody thought much of them. Because nobody really knew what nurses did, and we couldn't really, they couldn't really claim that they had any value to the medical community or that they served, in any way, served public health. But 30 years ago, uh, 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 nurses started carefully documenting their practice. They started studying the difference that nurses make in the hospital setting, in the clinical setting, in the variety of places that nurses work. They started producing research, a body of research literature. It wasn't just one study. It was 30 years of building a knowledge community designed to show the measurable differences that nurses made in improving the quality of public health. And now, nurses are well paid, nurses are widely respected in the public health community because they invested in making the effort to measure their own impact. And he looked right at us in the eye, Thomas Cook, one of the most Northwestern University's most distinguished living social scientists, and he said, what are you afraid of? And there was silence in the room because the school library researchers had a whole lot of reasons why they couldn't measure the impact of school library. There's a million trillion reasons why. Why? Because library service is not just one thing. It's not like giving a shot, right? Because sometimes librarians are teachers where they're teaching class after class after class and other times libra school librarians get to support teachers and don't have to do so much direct instruction. So library programs vary so widely. Librarian uh, researchers said, how could we possibly measure the impact of library programs when, you know, this one, the one in Narragansett is is different from the one in Westerly, is different than the one in Providence. We can't possibly measure it. And they came up with a whole lot of reasons why it was simply impossible to measure the impact of school library services. I, fortunately, as a born optimist, I think that there's a lot of ways to measure the impact of school library services. <laughs> and maybe it will just take a creative next generation right to be up for the challenge unfortunately you know what they say about how fear discourages innovation if you're running scared 
if you're running for your lives, if you don't really imagine a future for school libraries, you can't possibly be creative about figuring out how to measure the impact. So we got to get over that fear in order to figure out how to get to innovation. Now, what questions have, has the issue of measurement, the measurement of the impact of school libraries, what issues have raised in your experience as graduate students and as librarians uh, that are worth reflecting on? How do you understand the challenges associating, associated with measuring impact? Like in terms of the whole school itself, is the library much meaning of the community as an institution? Is it a significant symbol of what we're doing, or is it just like passively providing materials? Really important question, Michael. And that's a complicated question to answer, isn't it? Because if librarians see themselves as promoters, then the hard reality might be difficult to actually document. Thanks for sharing that great point. Other issues that are raised for you as you think about the issue of assessing the quality of children's librarianship in either school or public library settings. I, I, I have started. I, have started. Oh, oh, I don't even think. You know what? Oh, what? Oh, because I can't. Because I can't. <laughs> oh, Sammy, it's killing me. I know you want to die. Are you have laryngitis? I have stress. No. No. Oh. Hey, listen. Anybody who has Ebola in this class, like, come on now, please. Just be glad we're not having a face to face class. Sammy cannot infect us. That's right. And even if she had Ebola, she still couldn't infect us. We have so much to think about. My friend, I'm going to bring this topic up again. Thank what you. Do you think, when I read Virginia Walters, I, I, you know, I got on my little tirade there because I had that very uncomfortable experience of being in that room in Chicago with all those school librarians and re good researchers, really good researchers, very, very the top of the field, right? So I struggle with this enormously, and I feel like it really is going to be something that you new, this new generation is going to have to figure out. So um, it's an exciting opportunity. It's also, I'm sure, pretty daunting. Um, but I think uh, uh, it, is an, there, it is a real opportunity to build a career. So the fact that many of you asked about impact. Uh, Tammy, you asked about having a lasting impact. Um, uh, um, Jen, Jen, Jennifer, you asked about how do we measure the, that how librarians make connections to schools and parents. Uh, Valerie, you mentioned the issue of how to implement. Um, overall, I was so blown away by the quality of the ideas that you generated and the thoughtfulness and the good way you articulated your ideas in the flip grid. I, I sense a really um, a very talented crew here. So I just, I guess, we will move on, right? But um, I was super pleased with how you handled the flip grid. Okay, so let me go back to the, um, let me go back to the, uh, let me go back to the, to the screen share for a minute. Because I, I got lots of things to do. And I, I, I'm, I'm raising that issue of, assessment for you to think more about, uh, especially in relation to what we learned about in the uh, call to action that Yalsa gave us. And um, let me see if I can go back here. And in uh, Virginia Walter's own take on, on that issue. Why am I not letting, why is it not letting me go back? Uh, all right, I guess I'm going to have to, there we go. Okay, so let's take a look 
And uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you can move yourself with opening another window to Padlet wall number one, let's talk through some of the ideas that you posted on the Padlet wall about the six big ideas, the core principles of Children's Library Service. So um, really pleased to see some of your great thinking about uh, on this. And right now, as we're looking at this chart, if you have made a point on here, I'd like you to just um, pipe up and talk us through it. Who'd like to go first? Um, okay. Um, um, mine says, mine says that you librarians, you librarians to collect and collect and trout with most quite quite to to carry more, more to popular taste. taste. And I find and I find myself falling into that. that. Um, um taking, I do a lot of research before I get my books, but I do take a lot of um, surveys in my class, and I tend to buy a lot of things that are popular right now for the kids. Um, I hope they're not trash, but um, they seem to like them, and I seem in a lot of cases to be following that route of picking popular um, information. So I don't know if that's a pro or a con. Can you hear me? Renee is muted. Oh. oh, thank you, thank you, thank you for telling me I was muted. I don't know how I got, I don't know how I muted, but thank you for letting me know. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good show. So I'm really glad that you raised the quality issue, Tammy, and looking at the uh, core principles uh, that uh, Virgi uh, that Virginia Walter raised. We're going to talk a little bit more about that and the issue of who defines quality, how quality is defined, and uh, the changing way in which we think about what quality is. Uh, anybody else want to introduce another idea uh, in relation to the uh, this Padlet wall? Jennifer, I thought you were brilliant on this one down here at the bottom. Can you guys see that down at the bottom? Of course, what children want is often the result of massive marketing campaigns by adults with commercial interests at stake, right? So how are children's tastes shaped by the economic engine of the publishing industry, of the media industry? That's a really important thing for not just librarians to understand, but also families and children as well. Really glad to see that you introduced that idea. Uh, let me just re let me just open this up a little bit more broadly so I can see are there any other really great ideas here? Um, Okay, I think we can go to Padlet number, uh, well, I guess I'm going to respond to Jessica's point here. You know, this is Virginia, this is Virginia Walters, uh, you know, big idea. Basically, any type of positive interaction children have with books is going to promote reading. Any type of positive interaction children have with books is going to promote reading. I might quibble with that. I wonder under what conditions do positive interactions that children have with books promote reading? Is it any any context in any situation? Or are there characteristics of those interactions that are likely to have a better and bigger impact? So I'm not satisfied with that simplistic that I think that argument that any interaction I think it oversimplifies the reality and I want to know as a researcher what it, uh, in what context and in what characteristics of the interactions are likely to produce that uh, reading strategy um, because I don't think it's just any old interaction that works and I think uh, that to, to make that argument is um, oversimplifies a, a very complex reality 
Um, so let's let's uh, clip along to Padlet Wall number two, right? I really was grateful for the way you guys engaged with uh, thinking about some of the ideas in this book. These two ideas are the individual child is the primary user of the children's library service and the, libra the room, the children's library room is an integral element of library service to children. Now, it's probably obvious to you, right, that the folks who wrote the YALSA report kind of disagree with Virginia Walters, right? They, they don't actually agree with those two points. So let's take a look at what you said in analyzing the pros and the cons to these claims that the focus needs to be on the child and the focus needs to be on the children's room, right? So Amy, you did a great job, right? So uh, uh, you started by uh, giving us this, uh, you know, nice insight here, right, which is over time, the children's room was seen as a place that um, has to support, uh, you know, uh, basically every service, right, because of budget cuts. So, indeed, the idea that the place has m migrated, right, in, in, into its, um, it, its functions have changed over time, right? And, uh, Tammy, I thought you were... Uh, insight here about uh, are children the primary user of the library service or really are parents the target audience, right? And so several of you recognize that parents are hugely important in uh, as a target audience for uh, children's library services. And Amy, I appreciated that you recognize that librarians aren't always happy of these kids who are dropped off at the library and left there for all hours, right? So um, librarians often are not happy with the, those kids who are, uh, it, like you say, an undesirable group. Um, and I think that reflects a, a belief that I have uh, heard many uh, librarians share. It's a complicated and difficult issue. So Christine, you uh, echoed it here in your um, your observation down here. So uh, when we think a little bit about the child as the as the primary user. So I was really thrilled um, to see your your good observations about recognizing that these uh, truisms that Virginia Wal Walters states actually are, she deeply problematizes them. She does it herself in the book. And you recognize that by finding the uh, dimensions of those, of those arguments. Okay, so let's go back to, um, let's go back to the third one, and then we'll open it up for comments and questions. And you guys can point out to me points that were important to you, but I, I'm, I'm sharing with you some of the insights you shared on the Padlet wall that I thought was great. The final two core uh, practices of library service that Virginia Walters helped us understand are that children's librarians are the appropriate specialists uh, who can deliver library service to children, and that children librarians need to be advocates, right? And um, lots and lots of uh, commentary around how hard it is to be an advocate, right? Uh-huh. And, um, and I think that is, uh, I think that is, I think that is really, really important. Um, and, uh, Tammy, I think especially your point here about how when administrative leaders don't understand the, uh, value or the function of, of, uh, what librarians do, uh, then basically uh, librarians aren't going to be very good advocates and they aren't going to be able to provide the needed services. And I think that is a big reality that we face right now in the context of school librarians. Um, so, um, Christine, I'm really, really pleased that you recognize that sometimes librarians don't get any formal exposure to ideas about child development. So 
uh, for instance, you say they might not know what content will benefit a certain child or even what benefits are possible. I think that is a um, an important challenge we face to rethinking the training of librarians. And I wish I had the answer to how to do that. I'm trying to figure that out. Um, um, and, and Jordana, I think it's really, really appropriate for you to recognize that it probably feels overwhelming. Right? It often seems like too much to expect any one person to do and roll strain and burnout. Who was the amazing person who shared the great tweet on burnout? Me. Me. I Yay. Thank you. <laughs> that was awesome. And I think that is a real, real issue. Now, how about if you guys talk me through the questions that the new core values that you thought might be needed for the future of children's library service. If you have something up on this Padlet wall, will you talk us through it? Who wants to go first? I will really fast to say that in your voice. Thank you. Um, I wrote, uh, I wrote, uh, this is, this is, I'm going to move it really fast, Renee, so I'm not echoing. I'm not echoing. Hmm. Okay. Okay, much better. So I wrote that communities expect the library to keep up with each new piece of technology that is out there to earn and play with. Um, starting with the young ones, this is an important value to keeping up to date. I noticed that in my library specifically, they're always constantly trying to keep up with the new technology and the new rules and everything. And, and that's maybe not necessarily a, a new core value, but it's definitely a core value of keeping up to date and keeping and allowing the community to stay up to date as well. And I will unmute you now. Oh, maybe I won't. I'm sorry. You can mute. You can unmute yourself. There we go. Thank you so much for sharing that, Tammy. The pressure to keep up around technology is definitely going to be a continuing uh, issue for both school and public librarians. Who else would like to share uh, your uh, interpretation of issues that you think are going to be new core values for children's library service and school and public libraries in the future? I could share one. Thank you. Um, so one of the things I discussed just in my comment, um, and I should have given some context because I was really fascinated by um, the New York Times article that I tweeted to the class earlier today um, about um, this new book that um, just came out, and I was then I, there was another article about it as well that was more recent that I should have also tweeted, but I haven't had time yet. Um, and it was basically about um, college entrance and how um, there's some issues that analysis have been finding with um, with kids going to really high tier schools being um, unprepared to do creative work and sort of ha having um, been prepared to be in this very standardized environment. And so one of the things that um, was called for was more creative learning and more learning in an unstructured environment. And I was, um, just in my comment, I was sort of saying that that might be something, as, especially now that schools are going towards the common core and so many schools are looking at standardization, that libraries have an important role in terms of giving kids a way to learn that is not structured, where they can focus on just what interests them and um, have some opportunities to be um, intrigued in different ways. That is a truly awesome insight, uh, uh, Christine, and thank you so much for sharing it. It turns out that the entire movement toward informal learning is an incredible opportunity for librarians. And what I'm pleased about is you're right to recognize that the full 
scope of the inadequacies of the current approach to teaching and learning is people are gaining some appreciation for how uh, independent learning, informal learning, play and learning, learning in libraries might be part of the solution to the the part of the system that's broken, right, with its focus on standardized tests and jumping through the hoops. And so I'm really glad to think of libraries within the larger context of the entire education system. And you know, we know that the IMLS has really uh, uh, focused on that. When the IMLS says we want to, we want libraries to be focused on learning, right, then it's not about collections, right? It's, it's about learning and how to create learning environments in library spaces. So thank you for sharing that, um, that great, great insight. Um, I, I invite you at this point, if you have comments or questions, about this dynamic, these two visions of the future of libraries. The Virginia Walters a, a vision, which is very closely tied to present practice, and the Yalsa vision, which is out there. What comments or questions do you have about those two visions of the future of children's library service? Which one do you think, which vision do you think is more likely to be kind of interesting? interesting. <laughs> Was that you, Chelsea? Um, um, they go into they go such, into such go. Am I good? Am I good? Okay. <laughs> um, they go into such detail in the book about the empowering nature of having a children's room in the library and what that does to helping a child learn. But it's interesting to me that they won't empower the child to learn on their own or through creative means um, as like a function of instruction. Um, so it's interesting that kind of dichotomy and I'm sure that there are a lot more and that it's on a much grander scale than that. But that was something that caught my eye. Like, they're empowered by having small chairs and like books that are easily accessible, but they aren't because someone is still sitting them down and teaching. Not that that's bad, but that we're taking away their ability to learn on their own and assuming they need someone to say, this is what this is and this is how you do this. Mm. So, so very insightful. Today I found myself, uh, I am working in the Narragansett Elementary School, and so I found myself uh, in a meeting with a literacy coach, and she, um, she invited me to listen to the classroom next door. You know, the walls of school are so thin you can hear everything, you know, that's going on in the other classroom, right? And she said, do you hear? That classroom has one voice. It's the voice of the teacher. And those children will hear that voice for six hours, and there's really no room for their voices. And that vision of teaching and learning has been in place for a long, long time, right? Grown-ups do the work. We design the programs. We read the stories out loud. We, it's a very grown-up-centered approach. What, what happens? If we cede control and put kids in the center of the learning, and um, that creates a lot of anxiety for librarians and teachers alike, but it can also yield a lot of rewards. Chelsea, thanks very much for sharing that idea. Who else wants to comment on this? Two different visions. I pr I presented you. With one is a more is a is a future that's closely tied to present practice, and one is a vision of the future that's crazy out there. What are your thoughts about, what are your predictions and anticipations of which of those two versions of the future is likely to come to pass?
okay, I'm using my technique of wait time and it's not working. Why is it not working? You're tired, right? Is that it? You're tired. Yeah, you look tired. You guys look tired. All right, forget it. Never mind. On to the next topic. <laughs> I don't want to push you. All right, how could you know what the future of librarians are? You're young, right? I do want to I say really fast, actually. actually. Thank you. Um, um, <laughs> sorry. What Chelsea brought up and then what you were talking about, it, it's, it's kind of off topic but in topic. It reminds me of the movie Accepted, if anybody has ever seen that before, where they take the curriculum into their own, into their own hands and then they have to get the whole thing done. If nobody's seen it, you should watch it. It's really funny, but it kind of applies to what we're talking about with putting some of the learning in children's own hands and figuring out what they want to do. So the name of the film is Accepted? Yes. Yes. Cool. Thanks for, I'm going to try to Netflix it. Thanks a lot. Uh, okay, so uh, so now we're gonna we're gonna move on. I want to walk you through uh, some of the things I'm hoping that. Oh, oh, I know exactly what I want to do. I want to talk to you a little bit about how to write a grant, right? Because I think I asked you guys to read my Media Smart Libraries grant, didn't I? So let me um, let me give you a quick and dirty talk. This is the talk that I gave to. Um, this is the talk that I gave to the uh, School Library Journal. Uh, some of you saw me tweeting about that like crazy, right? So I'm going to uh, make the screen really big. Can you guys, does that, when I do that, does the screen really big? Yeah. Yeah. You can see my slides? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Good. Um, okay, so uh, we know we've been spending this semester thinking about how media and technology are fundamental dimensions of contemporary human development and that across the whole lifespan from early childhood into our senior years we're all implicated our, our, all of our uh, life experience is deeply enmeshed with media and technology from the cradle to the grave and so although moving image media is a dominant part of cultural life Many children, teens, and families do not use critical thinking skills to analyze media or reflect on media content and impact. And of course, we know that by the time children reach the age of 10, they start engaging in some transgressive behavior online and in relation to social media. And this poses new challenges for families as they try to uh, um, create uh, opportunities to have authentic dialogue when kids are really active participants in this media sphere. So the most recent data we have about kids and media use, we talked about this at the beginning of the semester, comes from a couple of years ago. It's about 10 hours and 45 minutes per day. But thanks to multitasking, kids watch TV while they play video games, while they listen to music, and they're on the computer, it turns out it's only about only about eight hours a day. But you can see that print pay, plays a relatively small role in the lives of kids as, as uh, media users with about four and a half hours a day of TV content, right? Followed by two and a half hours of music, an hour and a half of computer use, and so forth. So we know that children's media is a really important part of their growing up experience. And I bet as you look at this slide, you have seen many of these titles, right? Because these are an essential part of childhood. And it turns out that for library patrons, DVDs and CDs, i.e. moving image media, are a huge part of what circulates. Take a look at this data from the Public Library Association in 2012 uh, of the eight, 828 million print books circulated in 2012 and 423 million DVDs and CDs circulated. So essentially, you know, one third of the total circulation of, of public libraries is media. Uh huh. So I'm really interested in how do we expand the concept of literacy. You know all about my interest in helping kids uh, learn, children and young people learn to access, analyze, create, reflect, and act. And we've got some really cool data that shows that the use of educational media develops intellectual curiosity. Here's a very recent study from an outstanding 
a piece of um, survey research by Vicki Rideout, uh, my friend Vicki Rideout uh, from Learning at Home, Families, Educational Media Use in America from the Jones Gans Cooney Center and the Families and Media Project. Uh, among parents of two to ten year olds who use educational media weekly, um, parents say if they if they use educational media, they talk about it, they engage in imaginative play about it, they ask questions about it, they ask to do a project or activity about it, they teach their parents something. So it's clear that when kids are exposed to educational media, they actually it promotes it cultivates their curiosity. But unfortunately, many parents are unaware of educational media resources. Look at this chart. It's going to break your heart. Among parents of 2 to 10-year-olds whose children are in school, um, only, look at, the, look at the daycare, only 16% of daycare providers often or sometimes recommend educational media. Only 26% of preschool teachers recommend educational media. And even when kids are school age, only half, only 15% of, of teachers do it often, do it sometimes. So clearly, parents may not be aware of educational media resources and how they can promote children's intellectual curiosity. In fact, this research showed that many parents do not promote the use of educational media at home. It turns out that parents fall into two kinds of categories. There's a group of par parents that are protectionist. They simply don't want their kid using any screen media, whether it's educational or not, right? And then there's another group of parents a smaller group but still important group of about 20 percent who simply are not aware that uh, there is educational media that can cultivate a children's language development, their intellectual curiosity, and their learning. So that tension between the protectionist emphasis to keep media away from kids and the empowerment uh, angle to uh, enable kids to make to benefit from that robust informal learning that we talked about means that we have to actually incorporate both of those perspectives. So here's what we did last year, thanks to a small gr planning grant from the IMLS. We did a survey of 46 school librarians and 46 public librarians from across the state of Rhode Island. And we discovered that librarians currently do not generally use film and digital media to advance digital and media literacy competencies. Two-thirds of school and public librarians report never using independent children's films. And many librarians are unfamiliar with procuring and evaluating the quality of film, videos, games, and apps. About 70% of school librarians and 63% of children and young adult librarians said they would like to figure out how to integrate more film and media into their work. We also learned that school and public librarians in Rhode Island want to learn more about digital photography, they want to learn more about animation, they want to learn more about social media, they want to learn more about filmmaking, creating a website, learning to blog, learning to make YouTube videos, and of course, why wouldn't they as we see the importance of learning to be not just a consumer, but a creator of messages. So librarians are hungry, three quarters of librarians are hungry to learn these skills. That's why we were so excited about the opportunity to form a partnership between the University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Library and Information Studies and the Providence Children's Film Festival. On the website I've put a link to that website and I hope you take a look at it and I hope you look at some of the amazing uh, short films that uh, are available on this website. For the past five years, every February, the Providence Children's Film Festival has put on a 10-day festival over two weekends where children and their families from across the region can come to see high-quality children's media from around the world. And so what we've done is formed a partnership with the University of Rhode Island, uh, Harrington School, and the Providence Children's Film Festival, and the Office of Library and Information Services for the state of Rhode Island. We've proposed a crazy idea a series of public programming events, a series of continuing education workshops, 
a revised uh, LIS curriculum, including this course, right, and an online resource hub. Uh, so just last weekend, just this past Saturday, we did this really cool project. We had about 40 children, ages 8 to 12, who came to the University of Rhode Island's Providence campus, the CCE campus, and over a five-hour period, they worked together to make a one-minute film. These are children who'd never made movies before, and they never touched editing equipment, and they didn't know much about how to work together creatively, and they had a blast, and they made six short films, and at the final screening, we had about 120 parents. So as you obviously know, because you're taking this class from me, I see librarians as a key component of being a stakeholder in digital literacy. And if our project is successful, our Media Smart Libraries project is successful, we're going to increase awareness about the value of digital and media literacy among family members and community leaders. We're going to advance the capacity of school and public librarians to implement high quality programs that feature film and digital media in school and public libraries. And we may actually improve the quality of LIS education as we think of how to help the next generation uh, learn to offer these hands-on experiential learning uh, uh, initiatives. So that is essentially the, um, ooh, ah, hold on here. That is essentially the pitch for the grant. And, and in a be careful what you wish for, it turns out that that grant was successful. And I'll bet you noticed some of the qualities that made it stand out from among the 130 proposals that were received. So when you looked over the uh, abstract, the budget, and the materials of the grant, go ahead and tell me why it was awesome, right? Because it was. What stood out? Why did the IMLS fund this project? I think it's because you made it imperative. Like they had to fund it because you have, um, they don't have another option really. Like to me, it seemed like, oh, that like this should have been going on all along. So, now we have statistical data to back it up and like here's what's happening, here's what we're going to do to fix it. Like of course we're going to give money to you because you have a plan ready to go. Chelsea, that is a great piece of wisdom. You're going to be a great grant writer. When, when I was a very young person, a grant writer said to me, Renee, if you want money for a project, you have to have a big problem. A big problem requires a big solution. So you explain what the problem is and then you have to solve that problem. If it's a big enough problem, it, you have to fund it. So that is a key observation about one characteristic of this proposal. What else do you notice makes, made it stand out from all the other library programs that were not funded? I, I have a little something to say about it. I liked, I found, I liked that it was very to the point. It felt very clear, and um, it was, um, it wasn't too flowery. Um, I feel like the, the other, we saw another proposal a while back for funding for a project, which now I can't remember what it was. <laughs> And I felt like that, you know, I felt like that proposal was great, and I thought it had a lot of great ideas, but it, it um, wasn't as structured in their request, and it wasn't as sort of to the point of, you know, I felt like it did a really good job briefly describing what it was going to do and what the, you know, focus was. Yeah, it turns out that's a, one big trick for grant writing is you have to visualize the the thing. It's like you're it's like a it's like being a fiction writer. 
right? We haven't done this project. We don't know what it's going to be. We don't know what it's going to be. We had to just make it up, right? And it turns out that's another reason why librarians do best in a collaborative team. If you're trying to write a grant all by yourself, seated at your computer, you're going to have very few ideas. And it's going to be very hard for you to figure out what to do. But if you gather a group of smart women and men around a table and you have a conversation, people's, people's ideas bubble up from the conversation. And that's how this grant got created, right? It wasn't me. It was 12 librarians sitting around in my living room, right? And brainstorming and saying goofy things and laughing, right? And some of those ideas were like, oh, that's a good idea. Right? And so I, I think the idea that uh, grant writing is actually really deeply a creative project. It's a creative process. Um, and that really speaks to what we saw with the Atlanta Children's Museum, too, doesn't it? Right? The energy and the initiative that made that children's, li that children's museum so awesome was somebody back of the house writing grants for projects like an artist in residence, a bus, a discovery kit, a reach out to parents, and imaginators. Somebody had to imagine those ideas, write them down on a piece of paper, and say to a funder, give us money to do this, and then we'll figure out how to sustain it. And it's, it's a blast, you guys. You're going to have a terrific time with it. It's so much fun. So what questions do you have about grant writing? This is Grant Writing 101. Tammy. Um, um, I, have, have, I have written, have written three, grants, three grants. And I, 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 I do have to do have to like final research. Final research. And um, but I was, it was unbelievable. When I got the okay that everything was great and I was going to get the funding for it, um, it's a lot, a lot of work, but it can be a great process when you work with a lot of great people. Thank you for sharing that. It is true. It is a very addictive, isn't it? Once you start doing it, you want to do it more, right? Now, one thing that's interesting and that you might think about for your final project for this course, some of you have written to me about wanting to do projects. Perhaps your final paper will be in the form of a grant proposal. Hmm. Why might that be a good idea? Right? Well, a grant proposal has an elegant structure that is, represents a, a, a good form of planning because you have to think through all the elements. So rather than try to squeeze out some half-assed project in the next six weeks. Yeah, you could do that if you want. <laughs> but you could also write a really great plan for a project, right? If you can dream it, you can do it, right? And so if you can figure out a project that has something, some connection to the stuff we've been learning about, you know, one possibility is, you know, write a grant proposal and follow the guidelines of the IMLS structure, just like the model, and experiment with uh, thinking through that creative process, which is why if you want to work in teams, it's a good idea. All right. Enough about that. Now you've, now you've had a kind of a little overview of the grant writing process. It, it's 8 o'clock, so i got to get the show on the road here. So I'm going to... Um, try to talk a little bit about what I'm hoping you're going to do next week. So as you can see, if you move down the, uh, the uh, uh, web page for today, right below that slide deck is um, the activities I'd like you to complete for next week. First, I'd like you to watch this 15-minute video about Ed Emberley, who is a children's artist. I want you to watch the video. And then I want you to share some key ideas from the video and make connections between Emberly's story and what we've been learning in class so far about texts and tools for children and youth. Share your reactions on the Titan pad 
and make an effort to engage with your peers and their reactions and interpretations. So let's create a little dialogic space on the Titan Pad for talking about this video and its and synthesizing connections to the to the um, to the readings and the other activities we've done in class. Next, here's the reading for this for next week, October 27th. First, I'd like you to go to Kathy Schrock's digital storytelling page. Does anybody encounter Kathy Schrock before? Yes, Tammy, I know you did. But no, the rest of them, you are new. You guys are going to, she's pretty amazing. I met her when she was very young and we worked in Cape Cod together. What I'd like you to do is go to this website, Digital Storytelling, select at least six to ten pages to read, explore, and play. As an outward facing librarian, Take responsibility to share what you discover and comment on its potential uses and value. After exploring, use Twitter to comment on and share at least two resources. Don't forget to use appropriate hashtags, including LSC530, to reach people who might find the resources you're sharing to be valuable. One little notice uh, that I'm taking you now to a different website. This website's called Scene. And it allows me to track our hashtag over time, right? So I've learned when I type to, the, I go to scene, I type in LSC530 that we post about three and a half posts a day. And uh, some of our posts have been getting some real traction. Aaron, for God's sakes, you are a tweeter extraordinaire. Check out Aaron Darby O'Neill's great quote librarians don't need to know everything we just need to be the ones who know how to help people she tags it yalsa she tags it with our class it gets 15 retweets it gets here's another one by aaron aaron quotes uh, uh, this quote about the library's freeform learning environment it gets retweeted six times so Aaron, you are the poster child for great tweeting. And the rest of you guys are slugs. No offense. Okay? Slugs. Slugs. So get with the program, ladies. You are, ladies and gentlemen, you are outward facing librarians. And so not only do I want you to tweet about the amazing resources that you discover from Kathy Schrock, but I am hoping you're going to read Copyright Clarity. If by any strange chance you can't get your hands on copyright clarity, although I hope you can, this is an alternative selection. Read the Code of Best Practices and Fair Use for Media Literacy Education. And please read, ooh, please read Carrie Russell's amazing copyright tips for programming librarians about story times. So you're going to read Copyright Clarity or the Code of Best Practices and Carrie Russell's short article. And then after reading about copyright, Use Twitter to comment on and share at least two key ideas from what you learned. Don't forget to use appropriate hashtags to reach people who might find your ideas interesting. All right, what questions do you have about these fun and engaging activities for this week? I have a quick question. I have a quick question. Copyright clarity. Yeah. Uh, so is that uh, so a great resource that we can find? Pardon me? Is that is that is that a pen? Is is it a it's oh, a book. Oh, it's there. It's there. Ooh, ah. And you can and you can find it on Amazon or in the library. Your your library probably has a copy, right? But you can also read it on Google Books or download it to Kindle or 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 not. I don't know if there's any illegal PDFs out there. I hope not, because that would be a copyright infringement. <laughs> All right. So if you don't want to buy the book or read the book, read my other thing, The Code of Best Practices. It's kind of like a, so it's a less interesting version of this awesome book. All right. What questions do you have? Yeah, Michael. Talk to me, Michael. I can't hear you.
Michael, why can't I hear you? Damn. Wait, you, Michael, you turned yourself off and then you turned yourself back on. Ah, Valerie, Valerie, unmute him. Ah, beautiful. Valerie, you are my princess. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, Michael, what's your question? I wonder if his speaker is actually turned on. Maybe. Yeah, nope, sorry, Michael, we can't hear you. Keep talking. We're going to try to figure it out. Who else has a question about uh, uh, the work that you're going to be doing this week? Michael, uh, here's the uh, send me send me an email, and I will answer your question right after this class. Or or type it over here. Do you guys see this little chat room? Chat room. Type your question here. Do you guys see that over in the chat room? You open up the little blue view. Uh, you move your cursor over to the a left nav bar, a blue a little chat area there. Maybe you try that. What other questions do you have? You guys, you know why I'm having you guys um, read about copyright now? Because you, you will have to think carefully about your fair use of copyrighted material for your next deadline for your multimedia review, right? So think, think through how you use copyright materials in your creative multimedia review and be lawful, you know, make a fair use determination. So we'll talk more about that next week. What other questions do you have before I let you go? Okay, you're smiling. It's not the end of the world. So uh, Chelsea, Christine, Michael, Tammy, Valerie, and Billy, I don't know where you went. I, but Billy's like there but not there, right? Thank you for joining me for uh, uh, another installment of LSC 530, uh, Texts and Tools for Media and Youth. My name is Renee Hobbs. Uh, I have to admit the University of Rhode Island Graduate School of Library and Information Studies students are the best library students on the planet. And I'm saying that live in front of my YouTube audience because you guys are awesome. I will see you next week, October 27th, Monday night. Thanks for joining me. Have a great, safe week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.